Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. But who is he? Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And who is he? Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And what he do? And he's gonna react to all the self snitching. Oh. Hi, this is Bruce Rivers. Welcome to another fun-filled episode of Criminal Lawyer Reacts. Today, we are doing a deep dive into the probable cause affidavit of the state of Idaho versus Brian Koberger. But before we get to that, this episode is brought to you by eSign, eSign.com. Let's say you are a high-profile, board-certified criminal defense lawyer and you got a case on a string. It's important that they sign the retainer agreement right away because you're downstairs in your mother's basement eating Cheetos with orange-stained underwear. What do you do? How do you get that retainer agreement over to this guy who's in his basement because he just got done killing his grandma? He can't leave the house because he's wanted everywhere. So what do you do? You email him a retainer agreement and you have him e-sign it. And that way he can sign it remotely and you can figure out how to turn himself in. And get the app and you get three signatures a month for free. So if you have any kind of business where you need a signature, it's so much easier just to do it remotely. So go to eSign.com and use their product because I do. All right, let's talk about the probable cause affidavit for Brian Kober. Now, I'm going to take a controversial stance, okay? Now, I know I'm going to get some haters on this one, but me personally, I'm against multiple homicides. I know that seems odd, but I think it's wrong to kill somebody for no reason whatsoever. But let's talk a little bit about how they captured. You know, see, when this thing originally came out, it happened on November 13th, 2022, just a couple months ago. There was a lot of criticism of the police because they said they weren't moving fast enough. Well, this is, this is a result of hardcore police work, really uh, patiently executed police work. Now, when you are out and about, you're filmed almost everywhere you fucking go. If you, if you are on the highway, there are highway cams. If you're in front of a business, uh, if you're at a bar. If you're, you know, most bars you know, have cameras, like 11 of them, 12 of them, 20 of them, inside and outside. So if you commit a crime inside a bar, guess what? That's gonna be everywhere. And so, but today, in today's technological age, it's almost like 1984. We have cameras everywhere, everywhere. And so let's talk about what they, what they found. So the cops go to the residence and they find bodies. But what's really interesting about this is that there were two people that were in a bedroom and they were alive. They made it out of there, and they were roommates. They're identified in the affidavit as BF and DM. So let's kind of reconstruct the night a little bit. So earlier in the night, Chopin and Kernodal, that's a couple of the deceased, or well, Kernodal is, and we're seen at Sigma Chi. The two ladies that were in found dead in a single bed were at a bar between 10 and 1.30 a.m. So DM, one of the roommates, says that they were in bed probably by about two o'clock or so. By 4 a.m., she hears Goncalves, I think that's how you pronounce it, or Goncalves, saying there's somebody here at four o'clock a.m. They know that Chernobyl was on TikTok at 4.12 a.m. DM hears Chernobyl's crying or some kind of whimpering sound, and she hears a male voice say, it's okay, I'm going to help you. That is just chilling, absolutely chilling. And they also hear the dog bark. DM opens the door. She sees the killer. She sees a masked man, about 5'10 or taller, not very muscular. And then she goes into her room and locks the door. They find a footprint with a diamond shaped pattern right outside DM's door. And then they assume he, he exited at that point. So anytime you have any kind of physical evidence, like a footprint, for example, if they can match it up to a particular shoe, like this footprint they found outside her door was a diamond shaped footprint consistent with like a van type of shoe. When you get a print like that and all of a sudden they go to his residence or they find a shoe, you're gonna have wear patterns that are particular to that particular shoe. And those wear patterns are not going to be uh, you know, probably present, or at least they certainly aren't going to be the same in any other shoe. So, d depending upon the quality of the print, 
they can match it, match it to a shoe, and it is very close to being like a fingerprint. But they also found a sheath, a leather sheath that held a knife, and it was a very particular sheath because it had a U.S. Marine Corps insignia on it. And not only that, it also had on the lower snap, it had single source male DNA. Huge piece of evidence. Now, Brian Cobra, if you remember, was a PhD student in criminology. He drove his own car there, and he left his DNA there, and he left his shoe print there. You're, and you're a PhD in criminology? The one thing that the affidavit doesn't do is give us any kind of motive, okay? But let's talk about the DNA for, example, for a second there. The DNA is touch DNA. What is touch DNA? Well, if I touch this gun, that's touch DNA, right? Oil is from my hand and it's, you know, just something touch. If you touch an object, that object could have been moved. If you touch a door jam, for example, that's different than a movable object. So you touching a door jam means, okay, that person was there. Touching uh, an object like the sheath does not necessarily mean the person was there. It means that an object they had touched somehow got into that residence. That's another question we can answer later. So everybody's got ring doorbells, right? And everybody's, not everybody, but there's a lot of people that have ring doorbells. And there's surveillance cameras on the street, uh, at the college, almost everywhere. And what they did very smartly is they went and started doing a video canvas doing, uh, of the area. And they came up with a, a Hyundai Elantra. How did they find out that it was Hyundai Elantra? It didn't have a license, front license plate. They brought this video footage to the FBI and they have ex, FBI's got experts in this area. And they said it was somewhere between a 2011, 2016 Hyundai Elantra. They knew it went out of the area and it, they, they didn't have it on camera at a certain point, which means they know where the cameras aren't. Knowing where the cameras aren't is just as important as knowing where they are. So they said it probably went back towards Washington State University campus. Now, mind you, the cops are on high alert. This is probably, the, in fact, I'm sure it's the biggest case ever to happen in Moscow. It is a multiple homicide. It's a, you know, Moscow is a small little college town, just like where Pullman is, where Washington State University is. So, you know, you've got four brutally stabbed and very cold murders. So these cops are doing everything they can to solve this. So. When they, when they go to analyze the video canvas, like I said, it's, it's just as important where the cameras are as where they're not. So they, they talk, they figure it might be somebody over at Washington uh, State University. So they get a hold of the cops there and they, so they kind of have an idea what kind of car it is. Now mind you, they don't, they don't need a warrant to do any of this because it's just good old fashioned police work. So they say, okay, why don't you look around campus and see if you can find a white Elantra? Guess what? They find one. They find a, a white Honda Elantra. And then that, and then they're able to run the plate. They find it in an apartment complex, you know, one of the college student housing situations, and they're able to find out that that Elantra belongs to Brian Koberger. So now they've identified who owns the Elantra or, or owns an Elantra, okay? So we know somebody, you now Koberger has a car that matches the description. And, and that vehicle on November 13th did several passes by the home. And you know, anytime that happens, that's suspicious. So they identified Koberger and guess what? They looked through records and a month prior to this case, he was stopped by police. And guess what? As a result of being stopped by police, it was on a completely unrelated event, traffic stop, he gave his phone number. Once you have somebody's phone number, that gives you a lot of information, primarily movement. 
Whenever you have a cellular signal, you know, there's the cellular towers have three sides to them. North side, southwest side, southeast side. And what they do is they can triangulate you and figure out not your your GPS coordinates are pretty close. But in this case, once they got his records, huh. You know, remember evidence and lack of evidence uh, can mean, both can mean something. Between the hours of like 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. roughly, there's no signal. There's no signal on his phone. But then he starts up again the next day. So, and, and here's the other thing that's even more chilling. The murders get reported. By 9.30 the next day, I guarantee you, the cops are everywhere. And where is Brian Cobra? They don't know who he is yet, but he's in the area. He's in the area watching law enforcement do their job. Here's how disturbed this guy is. He's, he's openly posted, I can do whatever I want with little remorse, and talked about his struggles with mental health. He's written that he was suicidal, he has an absence of emotion, and he also complained about how little is understood about the neurological condition called visual snow. Then break hits, like winter break hits, and he takes off to Pennsylvania, where, he, where his family's from. His dad comes and picks him up, and then they drive out together. They get stopped along the way. And they get stopped because they wanted to make sure who's ever driving that car is the person. And they send that that video, that uh, body cam. That is SWAT team area. So we're, okay. I, I'm having a hard time being because of the traffic. So you're coming from Washington State University and you're going there? Oh. They send that back to Moscow and to the FBI and that's him. So if we, if we look at how they, they got this suspect, they start out by identifying the car. They find the car. They identify him. They get his cell phone number from a prior stop. They track his movements. They get his DNA. They have a footprint. Now, it doesn't say much about whether that matches anything yet or not, and we don't know. And they're able to track his movements by the cell towers. Now what are his defenses? It, it, there might be some room in here for a defense. If he can have an alibi saying I was someplace else and it, was, and it wasn't me driving that car because they, they don't have any, they don't have him driving that car that night. They don't have him specifically identified. He, and whoever did this was wearing a mask. Would he have a, a, a defense of a mental health Possibly. What cuts against that is his sophistication and his his training and knowledge of the criminal justice system. And it's not just enough to be a little bit wacko. I mean, you have to. There's a thing called the McNaughton test, and basically, you can't know right from wrong. There's kind of two prongs to it. You could be incompetent, which means you're not able to help your lawyers aid in your defense, or you you could be mentally ill at the time and not knowing right from wrong. And that's, and it's a little more complicated than that, but it's a very high standard and very few cases actually meet that standard. And even if they do, even, even if it's not guilty by reason of mental illness, guess what? You don't walk free. You're institutionalized for life because you probably aren't gonna be able to cure your condition, whatever it is. But my guess is that he's not gonna be have a successful mental health defense. You know, our hearts are with the families I mean, you send your kid off to college, you know, you, you can't wait to hear the next story about how they did this or that, you know, how they got good grades and they're gonna go to spring break. You know, spring break's just around the corner. You know, it's just really sad, these just beautiful people who were slain and we don't know why, you know, and maybe there isn't any good reason why. Maybe he's just a complete asshole, you know, which he is. but. We don't know why, and it's just absolutely heartbreaking that these parents had to go through this, and that these kids had to go through this, and that uh, DM came face to face with the motherfucker, and you know she's probably got survivor's guilt, she's probably got 
PTSD. So say a prayer for these guys. We'll see you next time here on Criminal Lawyer Reacts. Make sure you subscribe, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Twitter, sign up for Patreon, and we'll see you next time here on Criminal Lawyer Reacts. Bruce Rivers just broke down your case. He know all the charges that you about to face. You ain't coming home till 2058. That self snitching gon' get you put away. Bruce Rivers just broke down your case. He know all the charges that you about to face. You ain't coming home till 2058. That self snitching gon' get you put away. 23 hour lockdown, please is that my god?